and I am the managing director at Unreasonable, and that may sound like quite an interesting name, so I'm going to talk about a little bit about what our name means. It's based off a quote by George Bernard Shaw, which is, the reasonable man adapts to his environment, the unreasonable man adapts the environment to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man or woman. Um, and the reason that we're so focused on this, as George kind of talked about this earlier, is we're really taking a bet on humans. And we believe that entrepreneurs are best poised to help solve some of the world's greatest challenges. At Unreasonable, we create kind of an ecosystem to solve some thematic problems in the world. We do that by identifying entrepreneurs, typically those that have ventures that are between 10 to 25 million in revenue and financing. We'll bring them to an immersive program. So imagine this, we get 10 to 14 entrepreneurs and we'll bring them to the woods or a private island. And then we also fly in mentors and specialists and investors. And they also have a slumber party and stay in this immersive environment but what we're doing is we're actually creating a natural place for people to have conversations and facilitate collaborations and partnerships. And then we provide ongoing support for these businesses. We have recently partnered with three multinationals on a program called Unreasonable Future. So what we're doing in this particular program is focusing on the learning, education, and upskilling that workers are going to need along with the future technologies that are coming in automation and wearables. We have partnered with Pearson, Accenture, and um, Fossil Foundation who are all um, committed onto the future of work. So before I bring everyone up, can I get everyone to the edge of their seat? Yes, please move. This is kind of a demand, not a request. Great. And can we start with a slow clap as if we were in a work environment? Yes, start with a slow clap. Getting excited? Keep going? A little bit louder? All right. Yes. Exciting. So I'm going to actually introduce in a great style can we first get Daquan Oliver from We Thrive Up here? Yeah! So earlier we had a comment that entrepreneurial skills were taught in the early and late 1800s and then in 1905 we started to have more robotics. Well Daquan here in 2019 is helping to put entrepreneurial education back in the education system working in K-12 in the 7th through 10th grade, where he has a platform to help teach entrepreneurial curriculum to these students and empower them to think of a future for themselves, primarily focused on low-income communities. Can we also now get Mary Hayes up to the stage? All right, Mary is the CEO of WorkBay, which is working to make it easy and accessible for the entire workforce, especially low income and low, skill, low skilled adults to build skills and find jobs. So imagine you have an app where you as a high schooler could go on and you could see jobs that are available within your own radius of say 30 miles, but maybe you don't have those skills exactly to get that job. You can actually take some online training skills and then employers can monitor and see those that are getting the credentialing and help with job placement. Then can we get Rania Hotate from ID4A Technologies. So we've talked about seeing the world through automation and machines. Well, Rania is really taking that to home as she has an innovation lab that is designing and developing automation technologies that leverage AI, 3D printing, machine vision, and industrial robotics to accelerate the manufacturing process. And last, we've got Sean Peterson, CEO of Strongarm Technologies. So Strongarm Technologies is leveraging IoT-enabled wearables and sensing technologies to predict and prevent workplace injuries. One thing that I love about Sean's company is they talk about blue-collar jobs in the form of industrial athletes. And how do we get better insights on those that are working on the fields to protect them? All right, I'll have you all take a seat. 
So I think let's just try to create it more natural. So we'll just popcorn. We don't have to go necessarily in order. So go as you feel. But the first question is, one part of being human is that we can have purpose and meaning. So can you talk to everyone here about why you've created the companies that you have and what you think that what you're doing is helping to solve in the future of work? Yeah. <laughs> So it's funny, right? You mentioned purpose of meaning in the context of future of work. So, you know, as you mentioned a moment ago, we specifically serve underestimated communities, right? Now, traditionally, those might be described as under-resourced. Um, now, within that, the question of purpose of meaning is, well, at this moment, do those communities have a fair shot at whatever, you know, this room collectively and those other working in that space are creating to be, you know, next future of work opportunities, etc. Um, so for me, that was a simple an answer, right? It was, well, how does everyone have an equitable opportunity um, to have that purpose of meaning? And so, Quad, I know a little bit about your story. Why don't you tell the audience a little bit more about your story and like how that kind of fueled you? Yeah, I mean, high level. Um, actually, we're right here, well, almost right here, um, <laughs> across the way in New York City. Um, and face all the issues that New Yorkers are unfortunately still facing today. Um, and everything from growing up in a single mother household um, to seeing poverty, you know, growing up um, partially homeless, I've seen and lived through those stats. And, you know, long story short, I had come through a journey of social justice where it was never an option, what I would be doing just because I saw friends and neighbors um, back to that future work question, not having an opportunity to be successful. For me, that was my um, my childhood understanding is like, oh, there's not, like I didn't know future, I didn't even know what that was, of course. And so what I understood was that not everyone has an opportunity to be successful. Um, and that always stuck with me in the wrong way. And so somewhere, some, some shape or form, it just shaped this passion and interest in continuing to do that. And of course we ended up creating uh, an entrepreneurship education platform where students across the country are building real companies, earning real revenues for the products and services that they create starting at age 11, right? So we have 12 year olds and housing authorities that are again underestimated by more than 2,000 revenues because again, they're in that same position and how do we begin to build a pathway to be successful as well. But my business, um, you know, is this for no, Alright, cool. Um, so, for each, in terms of driving passion, it's kind of hard to be able to quantify that, what business, all the business value to your company. Uh, for me, my father died doing the stuff that we're trying to eliminate today, so that internal passion is relatively straightforward for me. Uh, but now you want to drive that and drive the real reason why we're doing this. Uh, it's not a sexy space, it's a space that's only just becoming a sexy space in terms of the investment world, which still doesn't make it really cool space in general. Um, but the way that we attribute those things and drive the same mission and value to our organization is how many how many lives did you save today? How many people did you protect today? And that's a number that we post on our wall every single day. Um, and you know, just be, and I guess on how that is impactful for our company is, um, you know, we, we proudly tell our employees that we pay 25% below market. People don't come to our office every day to get rich. People come to our office because the first day that they work, I send them out to the field to go see what's happening. I get them out of the city, first of all. We're going to West Virginia, we're doing deployments in Utah, and you're talking to these individuals who are literally putting their lives on the line every single day. And it's not for themselves, they're selfless people. They're doing it to put their kids through college. And they're doing it to make a better world in their own right. So the fact that we can create a bit of technology in Brooklyn and then help incentivize a team of really smart people to get it out there and make it better um, is you know, how we're finding our mission and our values. Um, my company, we worked in educational publishing for a long time and moved into corporate training and built international training for a frontline to first management position for a lot of household name companies internationally. And the uh, way we did it was by putting on the uniform and going doing the job, math and competency to figure out how to change performance. The extraordinary stories that we heard, the extraordinary loss of uh, value in the churn that happens in that frontline to first management position was absolutely illogical 
And also, the tools that we built for large corporate HR systems were tools that were needed by those folks we remembered who were teachers, who were community workers, who were chambers of commerce. They needed the same set of tools. So we started doing that, and it's become a focus of the business. We pick up about 2 million jobs every morning. We cross-reference them. We have a uh, 1,400 career cards. We mapped uh, and filmed people in every single job, in every occupation. We integrate to a number of different uh, open data feeds, and then we make it a really cool and fun mobile app that we can put in people's hands. And all the data is going back to the local community to create tables of dialogue between chambers of commerce, teachers, the local libraries, the Goodwill Agency, uh, the colleges and the schools. Yes. Hello, everybody. I would love to talk about my drive behind what I do before I talk more about our company. For me, my passion was always not only about how to leverage technologies to advance issues like sustainability and economic growth, but I was always, since a very young age, very interested in how we can leverage technological advancements to also innovate at a social level and to advance issues of social equity and social justice and how we can empower people to move into higher levels of consciousness where they can leverage their creativity and mind power in new ways that is away from the mechanical functions of the body. That kind of leaves us in a lower level of vibration, I would say, in terms of how much we are capable of doing. So for me, I'm really driven to find ways to empower people to reach to new levels of consciousness and capability and potential. And one of the ways we were able to do that is through my company. My company was based actually on a four-year thesis research that I was conducting in the emerging technology and robotics space for manufacturing. And that's what led to actually founding the company and commercializing some of these developments later to sell to clients and to create services out of them. Today, I Defray Technologies is a global technology company. We have over 265 employees in more than 10 cities around the world. We are above $50 million in revenue, and uh, we were able to not only add value in terms of sustainability and economic value through the automation solutions that we provide, we've been actually supporting our clients in the upskilling and training process of their employees as they move into new jobs, and we've been aiming to eradicate the exploitation of labor in global production pipelines, which is one of the major problems that we are trying to solve also by creating support systems and helping clients to automate their processes to increase their profitability without having to revert to exploitation in order to do that. All right, well on this panel, we've got two people that are working on platforms that have technology basis, but are working on upskilling and education. We've got two people that are working on some extremely advanced technology. So I'm curious for the whole panel to talk about where you see technology as a force for good and give some examples of how you're seeing that integrated within your particular uh, business. The basis that I like to take away from all this stuff is kind of similar to what uh, Ryan's saying in the sense that uh, we look at human augmentation differently than you typically would with technology. Usually it looks like an inhibitor to most items we're looking at as a way to increase the cognitive ability. So what all that stuff means basically is just, you know, we're just like a guardian angel. Uh, all these issues that happen, all uh, 250 billion a year is spent in common injury here in the States. All of that can be avoided. These environments, OSHA and things exist so that we can go in and make sure these environments are safe. So it's human error. So that's why things like automation come in. So if you can eliminate human error and you can eliminate the cost barriers that are of occurrence of that human error, then essentially what we're doing is just maintaining the relevance and the integrity of the industrial workforce going forward. So. Technology for us is the lead indicator to help augment those pieces that help keep people relevant. But what really is the self-sustaining relevance of all of this is using technology to be able to help people communicate better. And all of this comes down to what, how do you get the guy on the ground floor who's literally breaking his back to get that message all the way up to the C-suite? And that's kind of the trick to everything in a healthy growing business. Um, 
Now, we are trying to enable that through a technology that touches every aspect of the business so we can finally have safety folded into operational goals, whereas in the past, humans getting hurt was just a cost of doing business. So human lives were just a cost of, of doing business, just like putting gas in your car to these organizations. And us enabling the communication platform on there not only allows people to start to communicate and bring awareness, uh, but we're also able to actually put data points to the important things you're investing in. So we can actually tell you with a genuine ROI what the investment of culture exercises, what the investment and the happiness of these individuals has on the impact of your ROI. And that's what we've done. It's, it's how do we take a technology that's for good, but apply a certain amount of technology or development exercises to create value add for everybody in the value chain. Um, so that's how we're looking at it, is just increasing the cognition and awareness through technology. I'll pick up on Sean talking about essentially iterative feedback loops, and I think that that is something that's across all of what we do, is just trying to um, use technology to close the gap, connect the dots, and give access to information to the right people, something all of us have written somewhere in some paper at some point. Getting the right information to the right people at the right time and creating those iterative feedback loops so that we can do better at being human together by communicating better. We're taking some of the uh, data that is too big for our brains to take in, but uh, using technology to make it understandable, to make it communication and knowledge and cross-collaborative wisdom. Um, and then giving the greatest possible access to that so that a grade 10 kid can see what's going on in their, in their community so that the part-time cashier at a supermarket can see that she actually could get five bucks more at the manufacturing plant down the street and letting that manufacturer know that she has the skills to come and get an invitation to an interview. I think that fits to you too. Yeah, and I would say, so for us, right, because we're so focused on, you know, again, our students as early as 11, right, and so there's, there's so many segments along the way when we think about future of work and how that needs to evolve across the entire spectrum, um, and I think for us, what we consistently see is that, you know, we're taking a bet on youth, right, and so one thing that's, like, always remarkable for me um, is, you know, even if you look at this space here, right, this is a, this is how every space around future of work will look and feel, which is that there are no young people, right? And so we're, we're constantly making decisions or thinking, et cetera. And one of the ways that we think about that is to your point, right? How are we equipping that segment to make proactive decisions? And so when you're so focused on youth, then you're taking a proactive measure, right? And so a different segment needs reskilling, they need upskilling because they are there, right? That needs a reactive approach to be done effectively. And so there's a lot of different things that change up when you look at that proactive solution as a young person, which is how does this person navigate throughout the pathway of opportunity in a proactive way to, let's say there are still upskilling and reskilling resources. Right now, it's so intervention-based. And the problem with intervention-based activities means we need to find you, and that will never scale. Right? We would never find everyone, um, but if we could rely on a society that could find the resources that they need, um, that's where we end up taking our bet. And so I think that's just the one, the, the slight um, viewpoint that changes up from a youth perspective is the ways in which it becomes, you need to be a little more proactive. Yeah. And I will add to that from the perspective of what we're trying to do as well, what we've been doing for the last seven years is that for us, it's really important to, like I mentioned earlier, to leverage technology towards advancing the capabilities of humans and moving them away from mechanical jobs where their potential is actually being diminished, if not completely cancelled out. And back to the issue of exploitation, we have over 40 million people who are in modern slavery. We have over 218 children between the ages of 5 and 17 who are at work rather than being in school. And half of those children are working in extremely hazardous environments, operating heavy machinery, being exposed to cancerous fumes and chemicals, and being also exposed to harsh environments that are causing them irreversible damage on their neurological, respiratory, and reproductive health. Those are the elements that we start to think about when we want to imagine a future of work where social equity is actually a priority and where humans are 
being put first is we have to look at all the fundamental flaws that are causing inequality and that are causing lack of access to opportunities and that are causing all the issues that we're trying to address without going back to actually addressing the weak foundations and the gaps that we have in our infrastructures. So for us, it's really important to make sure that the businesses we are working with, we're also bringing that level of consciousness to them that if you don't have to go out of your way to exploit people and pay them really low wages and go hire children and take advantage of the vulnerability of people that are poor in certain area in order for you to produce your products and make the profits that you need to make. So we're trying to eliminate that incentive for companies by telling them, we can come in, we can automate your processes, we can help you to be more productive, we can help you to reduce your costs, we can help you to sell more and increase demand. And in return, as you increase your profitability, you can go back and reinvest in your workforce, you can create better work environments, you can remove people from jobs that they're not supposed to be working in, you can facilitate training and education, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of work we take on in terms of bringing awareness to the businesses and really helping to tackle the issue from the root rather than just come in, oh, let's just hire new people, let's train new people, uh, rather than looking at the fundamental issues like exploitation and lack of opportunity and poverty and other economic problems that we're not actually addressing to get to that level of access to opportunities to everyone. So I'm going to ask one final question, and then I think we may have room for one to two questions from the whole audience. You can either ask to one person specifically or to the panel in general. So I want you to start thinking about that as I ask my final question. Um, but earlier today, um, someone was asked about relationships and the relationship to work. And there's a really cool analogy someone once said is when you're in a relationship, you get to see the world through a second pair of eyes. And I think what's also fascinating is when people talk about their businesses and the innovations that they're working on, you get to see into the world of how they're visioning or what the world looks like to them. So I'm going to ask to the panel in large, can you talk about your vision for what it looks like um, in the future of work, um, in the future? For us, it's, it's, it goes back to the ability to incentivize the right behavior. Um, and what are we doing in order to create an infrastructure for that to happen? And for us, it's understanding more so what's going to drive the right movements. And that means understanding the people that you're servicing. So for us, again, I guess the easy structure is, you know, pay them more to be safe. But that doesn't work. It doesn't work in terms of any, any way, shape, or form. Uh, but what does work is understanding what's really going to drive them as a whole. And nothing that we can do is going to trump a good safety culture. And what can you do to help monitor that? And for us, it's understanding what drives that location. So what we do is instead of having like a rewards-based system where you get a free t-shirt if you left safe for two days, is instead we'll go and we'll understand where's your local high school. And we can just see that from the bumper st stickers walking in the parking lot. And we can go to Newport High and we can donate $1,000 if these people all hit these marks over the course of six months. Whether it be you know, a, a non-fatality, whether it be a positive injury, whether it just be an upswing. And what that does is it creates much more of an inter-reliant community because there are at least four or five parents in that warehouse that have kids that play on the football team. And that's where that money can go to buy new helmets. So in understanding what's in and around that environment helps drive um, our ability to put the right incentivization structure in place. And that's, that's probably the most pertinent role that we have on, on the ground level. And then for the managers, it's how do we encourage an environment where they can be more interpersonal? Because there's a portion of this where the coaching moment, which is just when someone pulls you aside and says, hey, why don't you focus on this, is so much more impactful than investing in an out, you know, a, 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 a off-site training day or where the other budget can go. So instead for us, it's how can we go to the managers and say, here's some really simple information. You can get some easy wins if you just adopt this new software. And not only that, it's going to tell you who to talk to in the morning, but you can have a real poignant exercise. And then we prompt them and we say, hey, not only tell them they did a great job and get their engagement up, but also tell them that they can take off early on Friday because we know that they have to go to that football game at 6 o'clock. So it's that kind of stuff that drives real culture. And what it is is just trying to find a way to put care into the system. Yeah. 
Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so I think the way, the way that we look towards our future is um, a lot more interconnectedness, right? Um, I, will, I will say from many of our alumni, um, it's funny to see like a 12 year old go from like not believing they can build a company to like then telling you all the things you should be doing better to help them build that company. Um, and one of the common things really just speaks to this nature of like secondary opportunities, right? And I mean, if that's like 12, 13, 14 year old saying that, um, but then it just like adds so much more weight, right? And so I think we're thinking a lot about that. How do, uh, to be honest with you, one of the biggest impact and role within that are corporations, right? Like they're not going away and they do have a vested interest in the communities. And so what are the ways in which we can begin bridging that? Um, everything from internships with Workday, right? Yeah. Um, all the way up top to um, skill base. Honing, right? So, and that's something we do do in our curriculum, right? We'll partner with a corporation that is like doing a variety of different things, either top tier, right? If they're like a top tier, like in their space to teach, like, and this is branding and this is sales and break it down to a middle school or high school level, all the way up top to like, um, think Microsoft Excel, break even analysis cash flow. So I think like when we look towards the future and, and of course, we're always gonna look at it from the youth point, a lot of that interconnectedness of, of how are we bridging that gap intentionally cross generation um, is probably at the top of our list. I'm going to take off my decline. And then Ronnie's going to go last again, but she says it's all right. So, um, so I'm, I'm going to take the hopeful view. I think we can go either way. And, but I'm going to hope that we go more hopeful, which is more interconnected. But I think we have to be more honest with each other in communities. Um, I'm going to take Memphis for an example uh, where I live. Uh, we have a city of about 600,000. We have 45,000 16 to 22 year olds who are neither enrolled nor employed. Our grade 12 graduate with a high school diploma tests out at a rise of grade 9. Uh, language and mathematics capability. One out of three jobs in Memphis is a temp job. Um, we have our largest employers threatening to move away because they cannot get entry-level workers. You might have heard Memphis in the news last week. A 20-year-old uh, father of three was shot while being arrested. He had actually answered someone's ad for a car and on the test drive shot the man five times and left him to die. And when they tried to arrest him, he tried to put that rented or stolen car through the cop car. There was a riot and 36 police went to the hospital. I work with the teachers who put that student through and gave him that high school diploma, although he could not read and he could not do any mathematics, but he thought he was going to be a famous artist and he was <coughs> angry that he wasn't. As a father of three, even if he had gotten a job, his money would have been garnished for child support. If you are a 20-year-old father, you will land in jail in Tennessee if you don't pay your child support. And so there was no reason for him to ever get a legal job. He could never have paid his bills with a legal job. And so we have this extraordinary disconnect. The jobs that he could have gotten pay $7.50 to $11.50 an hour. MIT's living wage calculator says, sorry, Granny, I'll be quick, says you, as the independent person needs $11.50 for a living wage, a single person with a dependent child needs $21 an hour to have the equivalent of what social services would provide for them and their child. So we have to sit down and talk to each other as a community of employers and educators and start to make sense. Because the fact that people are not employed, the fact that we have one of the highest rates of all OECD countries of people who are neither enrolled nor employed, is because it doesn't make sense to get a job. And we have to get people into those first jobs while they can still afford to live for $11 an hour. And we have to have pathways to $21 an hour for people who are going to be parents. And so my hope is that we use technology to tighten the table of communication and to tell honestly to each other how we're going to create a future of employment. Um, my vision for the future of work is really simple. 
I imagine a future where people are being treated as humans, where human rights are protected, where companies are being held accountable, where there is a rule of the law at work, and people are given the opportunity to expand on their capabilities rather than being minimized or compressed and exploited. For me, I think that there is a great opportunity to leverage the capabilities of technology again to move towards a better future. It's inevitable that automation is going to just be expanding and even more, that's inevitable. And with the rise of all these technologies from robotics and IoTs and AI and other exponential technologies, the workplace is rapidly changing. And the only way that we can make sure that we can create more opportunities for people in the future is to give them the tools and enable them the education that they need in order for all of us as a collective to march forward with the next industrial revolution. It's not a matter of jobs being taken away. There are so many studies that show the opposite. The fear of automation is completely unfounded. Yes, there are going to be moments of displacement that are happening, but every single study, and from us being in the industry and actually, and from practice, the work that we are doing and implementing these technologies are actually increasing jobs. What's happening, and, I, and that was mentioned a little bit earlier, is the skills gap is now the biggest challenge for the adoption of these new technologies. It's not that there are no jobs. The jobs are there, but the skills are lacking. We have to look at how we can create a closed communication loop between organizational leaders, educational institutions, policymakers, to make sure that all these organizations are speaking with each other and sharing the information and the research and the practices that they're actually encountering. So everyone can start to cooperate on facilitating closing that gap and facilitating faster adoption to new technologies. All right, one question. One of the things that 100% at work is wanting to facilitate human connection and human connection also comes from collaboration or partnership. Can everyone on the panel maybe describe a key need or a desire that you have that can maybe be facilitated by someone in this room? Could be hiring, could be money, could be anything. <laughs> Um, we need we need more writing. Uh, we are very inspired um, by the things that you write. I have uh, read over all the people that are in the book. I've followed all the white papers. I've, I'm crazy. I watched all your YouTubes, and that stuff is blood in my veins. And I just really urge everybody to use your voices and write your stuff and get it out there so that we can all really keep talking to each other and envision and think together. Yeah, I'm saying um, for, for us, it's we, the way that we create influence, again, in our value chain and everything we do is we follow the dollar figure for every single portion of it. Um, we create real impact. So for us to incentivize organizations, we work with insurers, we get the insurers to pay for the product, the insurers save money, they, the company gets reduced collateral, that, that's great. That's a great business exercise. But we never talk about CSR. We never talk about any of the other types of things that we can evangelize. Uh, so for us, it's how do we create more education in these organizations that this is the way the future is going, and this is how we should care for people, and we should apply the budget to technology to do it. I think for us, I can't think about a particular key need that we have that we'd like to ask you. But I would love to invite you to um, ask for my help if you need it. So if uh, there are any ways for us to communicate further, to talk with your teams or with your organization leaders to bring in the knowledge that we've acquired over the years or the data that we were able to gather and the experiences that we've had in terms of how we can help to create that new vision for the future of work and facilitate adoption of technologies. I would love to pass on that knowledge and that uh, expertise. If anybody needs that, I'd offer that. And if I need something, I'll think about it later and maybe you can circulate that. But other than that, thank you for being here, for listening to all of us. Yeah, I mean, for us, um, it's, it's probably twofold, right? So one is your local middle school, high school, city, 
right? Students there, making sure that they're prepared for tomorrow's economy. Um, and students will be thrived to those middle schools, high schools in your city. Um, and the second piece is that's taking that same investment um, for the future, even in your company, right? And so thinking about how are all the initiatives that you're running still purporting over to the high school generation? Um, many may go to college, many may not. How does that report over? We can also talk to you about that as well. All right, so basically, in sum, if you have any children, connect them to the principal with Daquan. Hand your uh, Instagram, Twitter, and all your white papers to Mary. Uh, Rania doesn't need help, but she'll help you help yourself, so go to her for that. And then Sean wants to get connected to your insurance broker so that he can then talk to the insurance broker to get his business into your company. So I think if you all understood those collaborations, make sure to find them during any of the breaks um, to facilitate some conversation. Um, you know, I think this was kind of a generalized panel because the future of work is so fascinating and there are so many different elements. We kind of talked about that with the IDEO exercise earlier. Um, so I think just continuing to have the conversation and figuring out how each of us can play a note in it is going to be very important. I'm going to hand it back to our host. Thank you so much.